train threatened to leave the Tour de France from start to finish when he delighted the Spanish crowd in San Sebastian by winning the first yellow jersey in the prologue time trial. But the very next day, again on Spanish territory, he lost the lead to young newcomer Alex Zula of Switzerland. He celebrated his 24th birthday in the grandest manner, but thought to be too young by his team, he would leave the race voluntarily before the end. France, who searches for a successor to the great Bernard Eno, struck back as the race entered home territory. And it was an emotional Richard Varenc who took the symbol of leadership of Poe. Destined to lead for a while? No. Instead, his RMO teammate Pascal Lino joined a breakaway the very next day on the road to Bordeaux. And he took the jersey to continue France's presentation of their young hopes for the future. Lino never talked of winning the tour, but his lead was so great he held on to the yellow jersey for 10 days, maturing as a great rider, but knowing all the time that he would lose on the Alpine trail to Sestria in Italy. Claudio Chiapucci, the annoying little character of the world stage, gave an athletic performance not seen in the tour since the days of the great Italian campionissimo Fausto Coppi. Chiapucci won the admiration of all of the riders as he conquered the Alps alone. At the finish, his feet had left little to the imagination, and the Italian public gave him a welcome, the enthusiasm of which was plain to see on home soil. Chiapucci, loved by all, did not take the lead, and Indurain, by finishing third, inevitably recaptured the yellow jersey he'd lost in Spain, leaving only Chiapucci realistically still in contention. Despite another outstanding lone ride, this time by the American Andy Hampston to the summit of Alpe d'Huez, Indurain remained unruffled as Hampson moved up to third place. Andy was still over eight minutes behind. Indurain's lead over everyone else had caused the riders to say they could not compete with the Spaniard. And in the time trial at Bois, he realized their fears when with the weekend to come, he increased his grip on the yellow jersey with his second victory in a race of truth that sealed this memorable tour. The Eiffel Tower, the tranquility of the River Seine, and the sunshine. It all adds up to the most romantic capital in the world, Paris. At the top of the Champs-Élysées stands the Arc de Triomphe, a fitting symbol for today's 130 survivors of the Tour de France, as they ride out an end to 3,000 kilometers of pain and pleasure over the hallowed stones of the Champs-Élysées. This morning, the race assembled for the final time at the modernistic development of La Défense, only a few kilometers away from the finishing line itself. Its ultra-modern architecture contrasting with one of the oldest competitions in the world. And it was here this morning where Miguel Indurain signed on for his final day as race leader. This is the route they all faced. It stays 21, 141 kilometers, and it ends with 10 laps of the Champs-Élysées. It's a carnival atmosphere here today on the Champs-Élysées and the sun is shining as France now prepares to welcome back the 130 survivors of this year's Tour de France. You know, it's only fitting the sun is out because they've combated every type of weather. The first week was particularly bad of this year's race. The Tour de France too has been a mini tour of Europe. It's gone out into six different countries and every one of them has welcomed this tour with open arms. Now we're coming back to Paris with a Spanish leader. By the end of the day, it should be a Spanish winner. Let's have a look at the overall classification. Miguel Indurain, who took the lead over a week ago in the Alps, now has 4 minutes 35 seconds advantage over Claudio Chiapucci. Third place, the world champion Gianni Bugno. The same three names who stepped onto the podium here in Paris one year ago. Andy Hampson will finish in fourth place. And further down, Stephen Roach of Ireland, finishing ninth. His best performance since he won the Tour de France in 1987. The King of the Mountains, that will be won by Claudio Chiapucci for the second year in succession. And the green jersey, it's been a battle throughout the Tour de France, and that will now be won by Laurent Jalabert. Only the third time that a Frenchman will have won this competition since 1962. We're not so interested in the green jersey today, though, and thank you for more than 10,000 entries. And one of you will be the recipient of this yellow jersey by the end of the day. 
Excuse us for being so presumptuous, but already you can see the signature of Miguel Indurain. And by the end of the day, it will also carry the signature of today's stage winner here on the Champs-Élysées. Well, the best of luck to you all as we will wait for the riders to come towards us now. But before we go out to the course, let's just look back at our tips, which we gave you at the beginning of our series three weeks ago. By the way, we did fare a little better than last year. Andy Hampston proved to be an outstanding outsider. We chose him as such because he hates pressure and riding without thoughts of a high finish, he brought about his best performance since 1986. His win at Alpe d'Huez was a highlight. Eric Broikink, our other outsider, disappointed early on and then recovered his composure. Broikink should finish in seventh place today. We had mixed success with our top five. Franco Caccioli found his first Tour de France very different to a Tour of Italy victory when he won it last year. He realized early on that he could not win this race. Instead, he concentrated on a stage victory and duly won at St. Etienne. Well, we should have known better. We said Claudio Chiapucci would finish fourth, but as any tour rider will tell you, he loves to surprise. Claudio is everyone's favorite, and his second place, his fourth, by the way, in a major tour, is richly deserved after his ride through the Alps to Sestriere. If there had been shorter time trials, Chiapucci could have won this race, and few would have been sad about that. A British newspaper headlined Greg LeMond as a quitter. That serves only to highlight the ignorance of the writer, because Le Mans can never be called that. He always tried to challenge for the yellow jersey, and with Chiapucci forced the breakaway to Brussels. But he could not cross the Alps, and on the road to Alpe d'Huez he was forced to give up. His first farewell before Paris in seven tours. Gianni Bugno has been the biggest loser. He came to this race having based his season on it. He alerted everyone when he was in the first break of the tour on the climbs in Spain. But after a disastrous time trial in Luxembourg, he was no longer a contender. But the world champion did well to climb to third after the second big time trial in Blois. The winner was a clear favorite in the beginning and a convincing champion in the end. His time trial performances crushed the morale of everyone. As winner of the Tour of Italy and France in the same year, Indurain is the outstanding champion. And here's Paul Sherwin with him. Last year I asked you if winning the Tour de France would change your life. Has your lifestyle changed since then? No, 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 I think I have basically the same lifestyle, but of course there are other things happening. I have more supporters, I have more interviews with the press and media. When I go home, everything is the same. Will this victory be more or less exhilarating? There's a difference between the two. The first year the emotions were stronger, but this year I'm really happy because I'm still at the top. It's also a demonstration of the work I have done and confirms last year's victory was no fluke. Now you appear untouchable, but how many Tour de France do you think you can win? No, I don't know. To win it's very difficult. But I feel that at 28 years old, I have three more years left at the top. But again, it's so hard to win. And there he is, the man in yellow, Miguel Indurain, cruising along nicely now and looking forward to the sight of the Eiffel Tower. It's been a very, very hot day in Paris today. Nobody has attacked. In fact, if I think they had dared to attack today, Paul, the riders would have attacked them. Definitely, this is the last time uh, the riders have had a chance to just talk to each other. It may well be the first time some of them have even seen some of the other riders in the Tour de France as we come into the streets just outside of Paris. They've had a little bit of a truce this morning, but when they get to the Champs-Élysées, I think the truce will cease and we'll see some incredible racing for the last time in this year's Tour de France. At the special sprint today in that race for the green jersey, we couldn't really call it a sprint. They gave it as a present to Laurent Jalabert, who went over the line lapping ahead of Maurizio Fondriest and Ocasio da Silva. So quite clearly, Johan Museo conceding the green jersey. Museo has finished second once before in that points competition, and he realized that today he wasn't going to get enough points back of Jalabert. That's where we are at Sevre, 64.5 kilometers covered. It's taken them two hours to do that. 32 kilometers an hour, just 20 miles an hour. Well, maybe I could have kept up today in this weather, but when they come onto the Champs-Élysées, I can assure you it will be a different set of riders in the Tour de France. The teammates of Miguel Indurain keeping him out of trouble, making sure there's been no silly touches of wheels and crashes. 
on the small climbs today. Just to bring you right up to date, there were three in the valley of Chevreuse. A Carlos Jaramillo was the winner of the first climb at Borgival after 17 kilometers ahead of Michel Dernis and Claudio Chiapucci. And then they moved on to the Côte de Saint-Rémy Les Chevreurs, where Eric Boyer was winning ahead of Andreas Capus and Abelardo Rondon. And then, by way of a salute to three former winners of the Tour de France, the final climb this year on the Côte du Château 4, they allowed Laurent Fignon, the winner in 1983 and 84, Stephen Roach, the winner in 1987, and Pedro Delgado, the winner in 1988, to lead the field over the final climb of the Tour de France this year. There was no wheels turned in anger at all, and those prizes were not even competed for. Now there's a superb crowd waiting for the arrival of the Tour on the Champs-Élysées. These riders are allowed their little fun and games on the road today. There have been plenty of those, Paul, but you know they're beginning now to feel a little bit nervous as they make their approaches into Paris. Now as they get nearer to the Champs-Élysées, there's no more fun and games because the final battle of the Tour de France is about to start. And you see the Bonesto team now starting to get up to the front. A little hand signal there was just to warn them. There's probably a directional island in the middle of the road, so watch out, and there it is. This is a sign that the riders often use just to warn each other behind of danger because they don't want anybody to fall off for no apparent reason. The Nesto team now will pick up the pace just to try and Miguel, bring Miguel Indurain onto the Champs-Élysées in the front part of the peloton and then he'll let everybody else start to do battle for this final stage. And there is the Eiffel Tower and the yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain can see it for a second successive year. He knows now that it's just the 10 circuits of the centre of Paris and then he will be again the champion of the Tour de France. The whole field racing the speed at last has picked up to around 40, 45 kilometres an hour down the banks of the River Seine. But until now they have ambled their way into Paris. And the crowd packing the bridges as we come in. This is a very, very well-used approach for the Tour de France. The Tour first coming onto the Champs-Élysées in 1975. And I remember on that occasion, they sold one million periscopes at 50 francs a time so that everybody could see the race on the Champs-Élysées. And since that grand opening in 75, when Bernard Tevenet was the winner, they have returned there ever since, and there is now nowhere else they could possibly choose to end this great spectacle. The streets of a very, very thriving city brought to a standstill by the arrival of the biggest annual sporting spectacle, the Tour de France. And the Bonesto team setting the pace on the front, the backdrop now, the River Seine, as they've looked after Miguel Indurain day in and day out, they now guide him through the streets into Paris. They've done an excellent job over the last week because normally in the Tour de France, after the mountains, you've only got two or three days to go before you get up to Paris. But it's been a week since the last mountain, so the Bonesto team have had to play a very clever game, controlling this race, controlling all the attacks from riders like Claudio Chiapucci. They really have been put under pressure a few times, but now I think today they must be a lot happier. Now they can see the Eiffel Tower there, and they know there's not too far to go. So the field now coming in towards the Champs-Élysées. They'll be there in about 10 minutes or so. They'll then be fighting out the end of what has been a million pound prize list this year in the Tour de France, approximately $2 million. And for the winner, Miguel Indurain, he'll be taking off a 200,000 pounds winner's purse, of which he'll give every penny of it to his teammates for the valuable work that they've done for him. He'll make his fortune in the weeks ahead in exhibition races and in personal appearances and licensing. And there's Pedro Delgado, the most expensive and elaborate domestique in the business, the winner of the Tour in 1988, now bringing the yellow jersey, his team captain now, Miguel Indurain, into Paris. The Tour de France has arrived. One big question remains. Who will win the final stage? We'll take a break. You know, the Tour de France is like an incredibly perilous journey that winds itself across the French countryside every summertime. This year's been slightly different, though. It's been like a roller coaster journey across Europe, but the danger is always there. And if you cast your mind back to last year, at this exact spot, 
on the sacred cobbles of the Champs Elysees, Jamaluddin Abdjazaparov was thrown to the ground, not far from the finish. Let's hope that the same fate doesn't await Miguel Indurain or any other rider in the tour for that matter, so they can all sample the incredible emotion of crossing the finish line. But for a select group of men, it's going to be a very special day. Their achievements in this Tour de France will go down in the history books. They're the stage winners. Stage one went to the Frenchman Dominique Arnoux, who will finish on the Champs-Élysées today. Xavier Mugialde took the second stage into Po. After a brilliant start to the Tour, he remained competitive throughout. The Dutch got their first win with Rob Harmeling into Bordeaux. Elation turned to sadness when he abandoned on stage 16. Panasonic's long association with the sport ended in fanfare as they walked away with the team time trial around Libourne. The Italians opened their scorecard with a lone win into Wascal by sprinter Guido Bontempi, who will be looking for a second win today. Laurent Jalabert laid down the foundations for his green jersey title by taking the stage to the capital of Europe. Gilles de Lyon won into Valkenburg in front of over a million spectators. He'll finish in front of another million today. At 34, Belgian Jan Naven surprised everyone to win his first stage in the Tour de France. He went on to ride his best ever race. The best time trialist in the world, Miguel Indurain, again proved his point when he beat everyone by over three minutes. At last, the sprinters had their day. Jean-Paul Van Poppel took the honours. He could do the same again on the Champs-Élysées. The French rejoiced when Laurent Fignon scored a superb lone victory into Mulhouse. The former winner of the Tour will finish in 23rd place. Rolf Yermin took his first stage victory and is one of only three of the Ariostia team to reach Paris. Claudio Chiapucci rode into Italy ahead of the rest. The crowd went wild as he gave them a superb home win in the resort of Sestriere. Andy Hamston became the first American winner of the Tour's most famous stage to the top of the Alpe d'Huez. Franco Coccioli came to the Tour de France to learn and win a stage. He certainly fulfilled that ambition. From the mist above La Bourboule, Stephen Roach emerged to take a popular win, announcing his return to the top. Jean-Claude Colotti saved the Tour for the Z team when he flew off alone to victory in Montluzon. Despite a broken rib, Thierry Marie surprised everybody in Tours when he took the flag first. Stage 19, a final reminder of who is the best man in the race. Indurain again showed his authority against the clock. And now with Paris just over the horizon, Peter de Klerk gives Belgium their second stage victory. And in fact, it's the teammate of Peter de Klerk, Johan Museu, who might well be the stage winner today. The Tour de France is coming across the Place de la Concorde, and the riders are now about to swing onto the Champs Elysees. You might well hear the cheers from the crowd here, and believe it or not, there is a tremendous following from Spain. The Spanish flag and the Basque flag are both flying in great prominence on the Champs Elysees, and I'm sure we'll see that very shortly, as the whole field now lines up for 10 full circuits of the Champs Elysees. And so now the field has the freedom of the six lanes of one side of the Champs Elysees. If you try to come along this road at 10 o'clock tonight, I'll tell you, it'll take you about half an hour to go along the Champs Elysees by car. These riders are going to go up now, the steady climb to the Arc de Triomphe in something like three minutes. I think this must be one of the most incredible race courses in the world. Just to close down the whole of the Champs Elysees for a bike race, it really is incredible. It's one of the most beautiful places I think I ever raced. Well, Paul, I keep thinking of your words that everybody wants to get to the front of this big field and show themselves now, which will make this pace go faster and faster as the riders come up to this very tight U-turn at the top. Every rider in this big bunch, and that's the way they wanted to finish. Johan Museu, who won a couple of stages in this Tour de France two years ago and finished second in the points, has never had a real chance this year to show us the sprint for first place, except when he was beaten by Jean-Paul Van Poppel and down in Strasbourg. But today, of course, he and everybody else will want to do a fine sprint. And I think we can say that there will be a sprint. I'm fairly sure there will. There's only once, I think, that I can remember, there's only once been a breakaway on the Champs-Élysées. If I tell you lies, there are two times Bernard Hino escaped in 1979 with Jokes Otomont. They escaped during the Valley of the Chevreuse. But the year before, there was a breakaway as well of four riders that got away on the Champs-Élysées, and Jerry Kanateman went on to win that stage. But it's very rare because of the speed of the riders that there's a breakaway. And this is Alan Piper, the Aussie, who wants to show himself for the last time in the Tour de France. Piper's ridden exceptionally well since the mountains, and as he said to us on one or two occasions, I don't care what these guys think, I want to get up there and race, and that's exactly what he's doing here on the Champs-Élysées. Well, we've had more than 10,000 entries for our final yellow jersey competition, 
and literally hundreds of you have outstandingly voted for the big favorite Johan Museo today to win the stage Van Poppel John Paul Van Poppel is the second favorite among you and not surprisingly Laurent Jalabert as well well I would have picked the same three and I wonder if they will be the three who fight out that finish sadly no Jamaluddin Abdu Japarov to entertain us at the finish line this year he didn't make the passage through the mountains eliminated at the top of Alpduez at the top of Sestriere rather where Kia Pucci was the winner now down the back straight to the Champs-Élysées for the first time the giant television screen that entertains the crowd and the same screen that goes up to the top of Alpduez up to the top of Sestria. The drivers of those vehicles also deserve a medal for bringing that around the circuit of France. Well, that's Piper going again there, but they've all got his number written on their stems, I think, and Piper is marked by one of the riders from PDM. I think that was Denbacher, the man who was away yesterday, and I was expecting him to wait for a last-minute attack, but you see everybody staying very close together. Nobody wants to give an inch on this circuit. Well, Tactics Paul, the Onsay team, I suspect, will want to try and bring this race to a nice conclusion for Laurent Jalabert, but as I speak, it's the Lotto team of Johan Musé. It looked like it might have been Hendrik Redant who was pushing the pace a little bit there. He looks as though he's got the orders of Musio, Musio to stop, uh, soften up this bunch. Well, they'll keep attacking all the time. But I think later on you may well see the Lotto team take over and start to chase. But at the moment, there's still a long way to go. There are 10 laps in total of, the, of this circuit, which gives a distance of 60 kilometers. So there's an hour and a half racing around here. See Miguel Indurain on the left-hand side there, still being shadowed by Claudio Chiapucci, who <laughs> won't lash this man from his sight. Well, we heard a lovely little tale the other day. Apparently, Claudio Chiapucci went up alongside Miguel Indurain the day before the time trial and says, yes, you may have won the Tour de France, but I'm going to win the World Championship in your country later on this year. And I thought it was a fabulous thing to say. Well, he's a player, that man. I think he's made the Tour de France exceptionally interesting this year. And the Tour, the tour and the sport needs men like him who don't think about tactics, who don't calculate. All they want to do is attack when they feel good. I think if 10 riders like Claudio Chiapucci have been in this year's Tour de France, we might have seen it a push 100 riders reach the finish because they do cause a lot of pain with the way they attack the field. Well, we've seen an attack there by Sean Lilholt and Vyacheslav Yekimov, the former Soviet world champion and multi-record holder as an amateur and now a tremendously successful professional rider as well. Phil Anderson in there as well, and at the back, playing the policeman's job, Jean-Francois Bernard from the Bernesto team. Actually, We've got a good little lead here at the moment too. Indeed, indeed, as we come round to start our second lap, as we go through the Tuileries here, this is a nice little move here, Phil Anderson still looking for the stage win, he's only got one more chance left now. Uh, Laurent Sil uh, Soren Lilhelt, rather, the former junior world champion, now well established as a top pro, Phil looks left and Solon goes down on his right. Well, as long as that's not a sprint finish, it's not too serious a mistake. Good little move here, but you look down the finishing straight there. You can see it's the Carrera team starting to take over. Nobody wants a breakaway to get away on the Champs-Élysées because it is so difficult to control afterwards. They try and react straight away. In fact, the lotter rider in the group there is Peter de Klerk, who was the winner of yesterday's stage. Well, we've talked a lot about Bonesta as being a marvellous team in this Tour de France, Paul, but what about Carrera? Because they have ridden above themselves. Well, they've ridden exceptionally well, which is why they're the best team in the Tour de France in the team competition at the moment. But finishing three men in the top nine is quite exceptional. Claudio Chiapucci took second place. From, uh, Giancarlo Perini took eighth and Stephen Roach in ninth. Really is a fantastic performance by that Italian team. And I think it's been a good tour for Stephen Roach this year. He says it's been training for him, and we may well see a lot more of Stephen Roach next year. He seems to have got all his problems behind him. And let's hope he does, because it's nice to see a man like Stephen back up at the top. Indeed, and Phil Anderson is now coming up towards the finish line again, as they have nine the circuits to go. Anderson takes the group through, and the chase is being offered here by martin early whose now job now is to pull them back neil stevens was in second place there for the Onse team but he's got a man up in that breakaway so his job is not to chase but to try and delay the pursuit that's being launched by the irish rider martin early this is up to the leading group and this is why of course that uh, neil stevens can't chase because we have in this breakaway here philippe luvio of Onse, former champion of france along with phil anderson not a big gap for the moment, just 10 seconds in it. 
you see how everybody's fighting to try and pull it back again it's such a such a high speed on the Champs Elysees at the moment Laurent Jalabert was still sitting back there in the group nice and comfortably Philippe Luvio there Peter de Klerk Phil Anderson just on his turn at the front and this is Yatislav Ekimov number 103 well there aren't many riders who can win two consecutive stages of the Tour de France I remember Barry Hovind did it a few years ago and I was there to see that and Peter de Klerk trying to do it today by moving into this leading group and you get some idea just how fast these riders are going now and they're giving themselves a total commitment to this escape well you have to it's so fast around here but this man really has come to form over the last few days because Lillo really suffered in the first week of the Tour de France and in fact at one stage I thought he was going to go out of the Tour but he seems to have got over it and this last week he seems to be showing the best form that he's had for some time up towards the top again for the second time eight and a half laps remaining in this year's tour de france and this small group trying to escape it's being pegged at the minute phil anderson philippe luvio soren lilholt peter de Klerk are in this breakaway vyacheslav yekimov was the rider who started it all around that very tight turn at the top now it's all downhill the hands will go to the little gear sh gear levers on the bikes down will they go into the big one and then they'll spin away back down towards the place de la concorde there's some idea of the cars that follow the tour de france daily looking after the riders who go through just ahead of them breakaway still having a great deal of difficulty to pull it back the gap is still 10 seconds as they went round the top bend there and it really is difficult they're going up the climb which you don't notice really if you walk up and down the Champs Elysees and have a cup of coffee but it's quite a stiff climb for the riders and in fact they're going uphill at speeds of 48 49 kilometers an hour when they turn the top and come back down the other side they're peaking at 55 kilometers an hour which is not far off 35 miles an hour the camera giving a little bit of a false impression here the field appearing closer than they are Lilholt setting the pace Luvio is the rider in pink Yatislav Yekimov to the left in the red jersey with the yellow sleeves behind him is Phil Anderson and sitting on the back at the moment Peter de Klerk of Belgium the other rider in this breakaway is Jean-Francois Bernard of the Bernesto team and we won't see him do too much work because he's on the same team of course as the race leader shortly to be named as the race winner There's some good workers in this group too riders who never shirk when it comes to doing their turn at the front bernard is the man there for uh, miguel indurain he has no need to work in this breakaway but it looks to me as if it's coming back at the moment there's only about five seconds in it and it's one of the lithuanians on the posterbank team who's ma making the tempo at the front there Arturis Kasputis it was Paul and he's riding his first Tour de France and has had a very good Tour de France he turned in some great time trials but I think he was a little bit shocked by the speed at these top professionals go up the mountains and that cost him a high overall finish but he'll be back and certainly he's resulted it's been directly down to him he's the rider in the pink and white so Kasputis who's closed down the breakaway they're all together again they'll have to try again as they go out along the Place de la Concorde Again, it's the Panasonic rider at the front who wants to take up the speed there. Well, Panasonic desperate almost for a victory here. And with their man Olaf Ludwig, they have a real candidate for the big finish. And now the attacks again coming, this time by the Helvetia team. And it looks like Henri Manders who's hit the front. But he's not making any impression. Lil Holt as Brian Holm has come up now from the Tulip in third place. As you see in the speed of the, the circuit around here how difficult it is to try and get away. One man, uh, one or two people have put down as a favourite today is actually Sean Yates from Forest Row. Yates has always ridden well on the Champs-Élysées but the problem is at the moment, the last few days he's had a little bit of a chest problem but he's the kind of man who if he can get away on the last lap he could hold up the big sprinters. It looks like a chance for a breather and you see as soon as riders free wheel there's always someone willing to take up the attack so you can imagine if we can get a glimpse of the back of the field you'll find one or two riders who are wishing this tour de france is already over <laughs> well this is definitely not the place to have a bad day it's so hard at the back as you go into the corners you see it's like an accordion effect 
and the riders at the front can just go around at their normal pace and accelerate but it seems to be when you're at the back you have to brake so much more going into the corner and accelerate that much harder just to stay in contact it really does wear the riders at the back down and Claudio Chiapucci going around there just like this uh, carousel or big wheel as they go across the Tuileries again Claudio Chiapucci in his polka dot jersey for the second year the Tour de France somehow wouldn't seem the same without him on the winner's podium because he finished second when Greg LeMond won the race in 1990 and then he was third and now he's set to finish second again. So the riders, when they come through, will see eight laps to go. And already we've seen six try to get away and we've seen how vigilant they are. But now the pace is on again to try and split the field. One of the race's most successful teams, certainly in the opening 10 days of this tour, RMO. They had the lead with Richard Viroc when he came into Poe to take the G uh, leader's jersey for a day. And then he passed it over to his teammate, Pascal Lino, at Bordeaux the very next day. And Lino led until the climb to Sestria, where Chiapucci won and Indurain claimed yellow. In second place there, just behind the RMO riders, is the Aussie, um, is the Aussie Neil Stevens, who's ridden an exceptional Tour de France and is going to be, as long as he doesn't have any problems in the next couple of laps, the first Australian to finish all three of the major cycling tours in one year, and that's that's no mean that's no mean achievement. So the Tour de France goes on. There's been another searing attack just launched off the front by the stage winner at Saint Sebastian. My goodness me, that sounds a long time ago. Day one of the Tour de France. In fact, there he is, uh, Dominique Arnoux. He sprinted clears. He saw eight laps to go. Well, this chasing will go on for a long while yet. So we'll take a break. You know, in many ways, it's been a bit of an untypical Tour de France. In the past three weeks, we've been through seven countries, three replacement vehicles, and some extremely unfrench weather. But through it all, there's been one reassuring constant, the relentless grind towards the winner's podium of the man who's established himself as the Steve Davis of cycling. Miguel Indurain was so far ahead of the rest of the field in this year's Tour, he was selling rearview advertising space by the cheek. Unfortunately, great champion though he is, Watching Miguel is about as interesting as the process that produced this show of support in San Sebastian. Indurain had heavy support in his home country, and so thankfully did we. Otherwise, the person or persons unknown who firebombed Channel 4's vehicles could have ended our tour before it started. For most of the race, though, water, not fire, was the prevailing element, almost as though some EC committee had decided that since Britain was about the only country not on the tour route this year, we should supply the weather. They're sitting in the bloody car. Jeez, these Keep going. Keep yeah. rolling. Hello, and welcome to the Massive Song Trail. And as you can see, the weather is absolutely atrocious. And for that reason, in my voice, I'm staying in the car today. Of course, the weather can play havoc with the condition of your hair. And this year, the race organisers provided a start line salon. Bill Anderson doing his best to adopt the air of a man who regularly has his hair plaited on television. Sean Kelly, though, looked like he'd been given 50 pence by his mother and told not to come back until it was short enough for school. Talking of mothers, Alan Pipers must have been mortified when he forgot the cardinal rule about giving interviews with your mouth full. Things seem to be quieting down a little bit. And talking of manners, Bad news when you can't even read the newspaper first thing in the morning without someone trying to videotape it over your shoulder. Stephen Roach, though, kept a cool head throughout the tour to claim the Sportsmanship Award, while his team, Carrera, deserve a special commendation for bravery in the face of good fashion sense, for agreeing to cycle 4,000 kilometres around France and fake denim cutoffs. With the race all but decided in the final week, everyone from the peloton to the camera motorbike pilots did their best to provide alternative forms of entertainment though thankfully no one went to the lengths of the French insect population to get on camera. Finally on this year's tour, there was the question of questions. We do our best to answer most of them on the show, but there's one that keeps recurring. Where's Phil? Where's Phil? Where's Phil? Of course, the real fan does a bit of independent research. Um, that's how I work. We've got the entrance up there. Um, Gary's come down down there. And I think um, Phil was... Um, Actually, that cycling fan was very helpful to us when we bumped into her in Luxembourg, so I hope she doesn't mind us having a bit of end-of-tour fun. 
Funnily enough, this is the one day of the tour when I can answer the Waresville question with any degree of certainty because once you're on the Champs Elysees on the final day, there's absolutely no getting off. So here he is as the race rolls towards its climax. Well, thanks, Guy. On a serious note, I must say it was so nice to meet so many English people around the route of the Tour de France this year. And I say speak for Paul as well in that. But this Tour de France is far from over yet because the breakaway we saw of Dominique Arnaud going clear, he was, must have been very surprised to be joined by 13 riders. We're now two laps from the end of the Tour de France, and the gap has been up to something like 40 seconds, but it's coming down rapidly now with just 12 kilometres, about seven miles left to race. But in this breakaway we have Maurizio Fondriest and Vyacheslav Yekimov from the Panasonic team, the big sprinter who won at Wascal, Guido Bontempi, Jörg Müller from Helvetia, Franz Massner, the Buckler team, Francesco Espinosa is there too, Artur Kasputis, the, Lithium, the uh, Lithuanian, Peter Roos from the Lotto team, Dominic Ardu, the man who started it, uh, Javier Merguialdi, the rider who also won a stage at Po, and the sprinter for Danza is here from Gatorade, Jackie Durand, Marc Sergent, and Carlos Hernandez. It's a very good breakaway, Paul, but it seems now that they're starting to argue amongst themselves. Well, definitely, it's always a problem when you have a big break like this. There were 14 riders there, and as you get nearer the finish, you start to get one or two more passengers. In fact, in the last lap, there's just been a split. There was an attack by Jörg Müller. They've got 20 seconds lead over the main group at the moment where there's a big chase going on and it may well come together in the final lap. In the front there, the group of five as we go here, that's Jörg Müller, the man who caused the split. Mark Sargent is there and Franz Massen, the two riders who win the day on the breakaway on the day to Mont Luzon. This is for Danza and I'm not sure, I can't see who the fifth rider is, but there are five riders at the front here. Well, for Danza is the sprinter. He's been unlucky not to win a stage yet of this tour, but he is the fast man. It would be a terrific ding-dong if he takes on Guido Bontempi. Who's won five stages in the Tour of Italy and a stage in the Tour de France as well this year. And, but it looks to me that most of the chasing has in fact been done by the Onsay team. They're anxious to pull Laurent Jalabert back into this race. It's a big moment for Laurent Jalabert of France. He's had a tremendous tour. He's now certain to be the winner of the green jersey. He walks now in the footsteps of the famous Frenchman, André Darigard, uh, Bernard Eno, and Jacques Esclasson. They're the most recent winners of the coveted yellow jersey. There's Franz Massen bringing the race through, immediately looking back to see if this breakaway is going to rejoin. These are tense moments as we come towards the end of the Tour de France. There is Guido Bontempi. He knows if this group stays small, he has a real chance of his second stage win. And then coming round the main field, safely inside this pack, the yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain. The best rider in that leading group is Javier Mergualdi, and he is 46 minutes behind overall. So there's no problems there for Miguel Indurain today. So as they race across the Tuileries now, it looks like Mergualdi, I think, is trying to get away from the front of that field again. But they'll come through for the bell this time, just one lap, six kilometers, 3.6 miles, whichever language you speak, that's what it means. This Tour de France now rolling to a close as they head across towards the turn into the Champs-Élysées for the final time. There's Maurizio Fondriest, or one lap to go indeed. And, well, we very, very rarely are treated to a small escape finding the speed to hold off the big field on the Champs-Élysées. At the moment, these five riders are doing it. They're doing a great job as well, and I'm sure that Franz Massen and Mark Sargent have cast their minds back to the mistake they made a couple of days ago, which is why they're working so hard now to try and make amends for that. As they come across the Place de la Concorde, they'll come in to the Champs-Élysées for the last time. They've got to go up to the top, turn round underneath the shadow of the Arc de Triomphe, and the next time they'll come round, if they can hold on, then they're going to dispute the finish for one of the best stages of the Tour de France. Mark Sargent's the man leading them in. When they come here, they'll get the bell with one lap to go. Fondriest taking over from his teammate, Marc Sejon, and they could well work out a 1-2 here because they have the numerical advantage, if nothing else. Fondriest is driving the train. He might rely on Marc Sejon to finish it off. There's the bell, the last lap of the Champs-Élysées in the Tour de France. Today, the riders in the saddle, the three hours and 20 minutes, and that is a familiar sight. The boys in pink, the Once riders, now trying to pull their man back into the race, but the yellow jersey of Miguel Indurain happily ensconced in the center of the peloton. He now rests just six kilometers away from his second win in the Tour de France. 
Well, it's coming down rapidly now. Last time it was 20 seconds on the line. It's now down to 11. The one or two teams more than the Onsay team chasing at the front there. PDM have got a lot of riders. So have the Lotto team as well. As we look a look from the helicopter, you can see it's 200 metres, roughly the gap. Diaz Zabala, the number one on the team there. He's doing all the work he can, followed by Stephen Hodge. And there's a lot of people suffering badly in that big bunch now as they've kept their average speed up. We don't yet know if they've redeemed themselves to run out as a record Tour de France. We'll find that out later on, of course. But right now, all of a sudden, this long, steady climb up to the Arc de Triomphe, you hardly notice on a normal day, is now going to hurt these riders in their bid for victory. Just 11 seconds with one lap to go. And Fondrias still finding the speed to bring that line through. But the gap, I think, Paul, is coming down coming down rapidly they gave us the official time check there of 11 set of 13 seconds but i actually made it 11 on my clock we'll get another idea when they go around the top here just below the arc de triomphe very difficult finish if these five riders stay away because maurizio fondrias and franz masson know each other extremely well in fact only last year they sprinted for victory in the amstel gold race and franz masson took the line ahead of fondrias who is normally the better sprinter of the two you see masson now starting to suffer this top of this climb here really is getting harder and that's a Casio da Silva trying to bridge the gap without anybody else with him down the road there as they turn at the top of the Champs-Élysées for the final time Masson again at the same point looks across to see who is chasing the answer is Acasio da Silva and on this wheel there I think it's possibly uh, let's have a look who it is it's the French rider in the Helvetia team I think in fact it's Krieger who has come through there behind the da Silva but there's still we haven't caught sight all day, Paul, of the black top jersey, the champion of Belgium, Johan Museu. Well, we haven't seen him too clearly, but you can be sure he's hovering near the first six or seven riders in this bunch, because if it comes back together, he wants to try and win. He's won here before, he knows the sprint. He won a couple of years ago when he won the stage to Mont Saint-Michel as well. He'll be waiting there in the shadows. Also, you should see in there the green jersey on the shoulders of Laurent Jalabert, the Frenchman who really wants to Walk up, walk up the Champs-Élysées a little bit later on, do his lap of honour with that green jersey on his shoulders. But now what everybody's thinking about is winning the final stage. The pink jersey at the front there, I'm sure, will be Neil Stevens, who's worked like a Trojan the last few days, working to try and help Laurent Jalabert conquer that green jersey. Fully deserves uh, a little bit of history in the Australian cycling record books. Neil Stevens becoming the first Australian to compete in and finish all three of the world's major tours in the same year, the Tour of Spain, Italy and France. A tremendous achievement indeed. Just to in insist a little bit on that piece of, a piece of history that Neil Stevens is doing, that less than 15 men have ever managed to do that. It's an incredible feat just to ride two of these stage races in one year, but to ride three is brilliant. And it looks to me as if Stevens is doing the job of the day again. I know the camera brings it so much closer together, but I think uh, when we come to the last lap, it may well be that we're going to be treated to that big bunch sprint. Or well, the last corner even, because we're going out on the Place de la Concorde now for the final time. And you know, as this field comes into contention with those five leaders, it could well be that one of them will make a dive for the line and spoil the fun. And Peter Roos is trying to get on to the back wheel here of Fondriest, who looks over his shoulder, Dominic Arnu, and Peter Roos it is who's going to have a go. Peter Roos, the man whose name we have never mentioned once in three weeks of the Tour de France, until today, now jumps for what he hopes will be the biggest moment of his life as he goes out along the Place de la Concorde for the final time. Well, when they came by me, it was almost back together again there. There was three seconds in it. Peter Roos waited just for that one moment when they were almost caught and launched a counter-attack. He was marked, I think, by Maurizio Fondriest. And the other rider, I think, is Dominique Arnoux, and they may be going away again. There's a little bit of disarray at the front there. The team, Onse, who've done so much work to bring it back together. Fondriest wants the rest of the riders to work with him. But you can see now that it's almost over. The RMO rider on the front, I think, will be Thierry Laurent. He's brought it all back together. And he's going straight away with Jesper Skibby on his back wheel as he goes now. So the breakaway that threatened to end this Tour de France, it was away for 38 kilometres. They've caught it, well, more than that, 40 kilometres, because they've caught them in the last two kilometres of the race today. And Jesper Skibby, once uh, third overall in the Tour de France, got washed away in the mountains, has now refound his legs. Now can he take it? 
Attilio Aron comes straight through. He's the man who launched the attack, but he was marked straight away by Jesper Skibbe. One of the Panasonics coming up again. That may well be Ekimov. It is Ekimov who leaps down the left-hand side of the road. If a man can fly to the finish at this speed, Yatislav Ekimov is that man. He's done it before in a stage of the Tour de France, having taken it out after breaking away in the last kilometre. He is arguably still the fastest man in the world. He's held the world hour record, the world pursuit record. He's been the world pursuit champion. That is purely for a man who has speed and nothing else. And look at this, he's gone. Vyacheslav Yekimov has come over the hill there, his elbows piercing the wind, and he's settling into his pursuit position. This is a superb ride and would most certainly be a very popular win. The former Soviet rider, one of the fastest amateurs the world ever saw, is now going for gold on the last stage of the Tour de France. An Olympic champion as the Olympics open in Barcelona, going for gold here on the Champs-Élysées. Well, at the end of that straight, he's going to have one kilometre to go, but a Trojan work being done by the Lotto team at the front, that's Henrik Redant followed by the man we hadn't seen very much of, Johan Museo. Following him in the green jersey is Laurent Jalabert. It's going to be very close on the line. They're coming up now to one kilometre to go. This is the Place de la Concorde. He's just got to get round the final corner. Well, this is amazing, but this is how you win stages. And look at this, the hare and the hounds. Vyacheslav Yekimov, he's won the stage four in exactly the same manner. Over 4,000 metres, he was unbeatable as an amateur. He turned professional and he won the world title over 5,000 metres. He's only had to survive just over a kilometre a day as he's being chased down by Soren Lilholt. And the Piper's in there too, about fourth or fifth place. The Green Jays of Jalabert. Far right is Johan Museo taking on Jalabert. They're going to pass Yekimov on the line. Johan Museo is taking the run. Don't look over your shoulder, Vyacheslav. Go for it. Olaf Ludwig comes to the middle now. You've got Musier. Ludwig takes it on the line and he beats Jean-Paul Van Poppel and Johan Museo right on the line. Well, can you believe that the consolation for Yekimov is his teammate Olaf Ludwig has won the last stage of the Tour de France. And over the line safely, and that's all he wanted to do today was the yellow jersey. He takes the hand of his teammate and shakes it. Miguel Indurain all smiles today but there is Olaf Ludwig a former Olympic champion it's indeed still the reigning Olympic champion from Seoul he'll lose that title in seven days time in the Olympic road race in Barcelona but right now Olaf Ludwig is on top again the winner today of the last stage of the Tour de France and so now you can see the battle of the sprinters Olaf Ludwig in the end coming right up on his teammate and having to pass him on the line. I'm sure he'd be unhappy about that, but he had to do it because Musier and Van Poppel in the white were coming so quickly. And right on the line, it looks as though Van Poppel and Musier have both got over the top of the poor Vyacheslav Yekimov. They take one, two, three today. Jalabert too is coming, but coming late. And the winner, no doubt about it, Olaf Ludwig just from Jean-Paul Van Poppel of Holland and Musier is third. The sprinters at last having the day here on the Champs-Élysées, a win for Olaf Ludwig, the former East German Olympic champion. Jean-Paul Van Poppel comes home in second place. He only ever races for the win when he thinks he has it. He is beaten into second today. Johan Museo, the champion of Belgium, is third. Laurent Jalabert, who's had one stage win in this Tour de France, also goes home tonight as only the third French winner of the green jersey in 30 years. But the happy man on the podium, Olaf Ludwig, he'll see his Olympic title disappear next Sunday in Barcelona, but he won't worry about that now. He's won the final stage of the Tour de France. But the real champion of this year's race, and indeed for a second year, the Spanish rider Miguel Indurain. He beats Claudio Chiapucci, a bigger margin this year.